Just kidding. So hey, we are back in the book of Kings, Second Kings, this Sunday. We're beginning uh, our last book that we've been in the last couple of years. We did First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings last year, and in this fall, we're back in the Kings. And Lord willing, we'll finish the book of Second Kings. I think by December, the end of December is when we'll have our last message. Kind of as a, a, just a recap and maybe kind of setting the plate this morning, uh, just want to remind you and kind of refresh your, wh- where you're at and your understanding of the context of when this book took place or the events that are recorded in this book. If you'll remember, and, and we're in the time of the kingdom years of Israel, right? We know from our Old Testament, beginning with the books of Moses and forward, we know that God called the people unto Himself, beginning with Abraham. They were in captivity for a number of years in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They came into the Promised Land through the leadership of Moses and then Joshua. And then Joshua leads them into the Promised Land as they take the Promised Land given to them by God. Now, there was a period after Joshua where there was no leadership within the nation of Israel. It's the time of the judges. And if you remember this phrase, it repeats a lot in that book, where it says that everyone did was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel, right? And that brings us up to the book of 1 Samuel. The country, the nation is in disarray. There is moral decay. Even the high priest is corrupt and his sons are corrupt. And then God raises up Samuel, the prophet, Right? He's also known as the kingmaker because he was the one whom God would use to anoint Israel's first king. Remember who that is? That is Saul. Saul is the nation's first king, but unfortunately, Saul, if you remember, was not a godly king. He was a king like the nations had. That's what the children of Israel asked for. He was selfish. He was self-seeking. He was not godly, and he was a disaster. Nevertheless, he reigned for about 40 years. But during his reign, remember, God identifies a man who would be the pinnacle of all the kings, his servant David. Remember, David was a man after God's own heart. David was Israel's most godly king that they would ever have up to this point. In fact, every king in the book of Kings is compared to David. And they either are like him or they are not. But David was not a perfect man, was he? David was flawed. David was a sinner. And we see all of that in the book of First and Second Samuel, right? And then his son Solomon, the pinnacle of economic prosperity in Israel, and yet he was a disaster as a king. His heart was drawn to many women and their false gods. Now, when you think about that, that's why we've entitled this series that we've been in, The Kings and the King. Because the books of Samuel and the books of Kings anticipate the need for the perfect king. One of the things that's true in in these books that we see front and center, if you look, it's there, is that God is the perfect king. That God has always been their king, but his people are what? We're human. We're not spirit like he is. And so even in this book, God is the perfect king, and yet there is this disconnect because they can't see him. He's not present with them. And yet every king that rises up to be the leaders of the nation (coughs) falls short of what they need. Why do I say that? It's because these books anticipate the need for the God-man, the king who would come. Indeed, 100 years later from this point, but they anticipate King Jesus. So in a very real sense, these books kind of set the stage for the king of Israel who would come in the first century, and that is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God, who is like us, human, but who is also God. So keep that in mind as we jump back into the study of the kings. These events, these kings, point to and anticipate the need for our true king, King Jesus. So after Solomon, 
what happens? You remember the kingdom divides. His son Rehoboam is foolish and it divides to the two southern tribes, Judah and, and uh, Benjamin, and the other ten are known as Israel or the northern kingdom. That's the time we find ourselves in the book of 2 Kings during the divided kingdom years. If you remember, when we ended, I think it was in May, there was the end of 1 Kings, is, it focuses on the leadership of Ahab, king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you remember, Ahab was a capable leader. He led the nation into prosperity economically. He built up cities. He lived in an opulent, rich court. But spiritually, he was a train wreck. He was a train wreck. And then, don't get me started on his wife, who also led with him, known as Jezebel. As 1 Kings ends, it ends with the record of Ahab's death. And we're going to begin 2 Kings with the son, his son Ahaziah. And what we're going to see today, or today's message, is entitled, Is There No God? And you're going to see where we get that from the text. Ahaziah, Ahab's son, is now the king, and we will see whether or not he follows in his parents' footsteps are not, right? Now, keep in mind, up to this point, God has demonstrated to His people over and over again that He is far superior than the false gods of Canaan, Baal, and the Ashtoreth, right? Over and over again, He has demonstrated that He is God, they are not, they are false, He is real, right? And the, if you remember, the, the pinnacle of that was Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Remember? But that wasn't the only one, but that was probably the most memorable showdown between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and Baal, the God of the Canaanites. Ahaziah is aware of all of that. Keep that in mind as we jump into today's text and address the issue, is there no God, from the first two chapters. He's on the throne. So open your Bibles if you don't have them already open or turn them on to 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1, as we consider, is there no God? And I'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is what it says, Now Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of ba Baalsebub, the god of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to him, Is it because there is no god in Israel? that you are going to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then Elijah departed. So Ahaziah is king. He's the son of Ahab and Jezebel. We're told he's dealing with the rebellion of Moab. That was the uh, nation to the south that the northern kingdom had domination over. Moab was required to send tribute to the northern kingdom. However, during this time, whenever there was a change, when the old king passed away and his son took over, the nations who were subservient or gave tribute to the kingdoms, they would challenge that to see if the new king would be able to keep them under control. We're going to see that come in more full focus next week, but that's what's going on. Moab is rebelling, and Ahaziah, the new king, is also dealing with an injury. It says that he fell through the lattice from his upper chamber. More than likely, he's on the second story, and he falls down to the first story, and he's injured. And it appears as though he is not going to recover. So what does he do? He wants to know, will I recover from this injury? 
But rather than seek out the God of Israel, where does he go? He goes to the false God of Baal. In fact, one of the chief gods of the nation of the Philistines. That's the city of Ekron. That's one of their five major cities. And he goes to the false god, which name literally means Lord of the Flies. Now, we're not quite sure if the Hebrews wrote that as a mockery of their god because it's very close to Baal the prince. So maybe that's what he was known as. But the Israelites call him Lord of the Flies. Either way, he's a false god. And he tries to go to him in secret, sends messengers. And God demonstrates to him, it's like, no, no. It doesn't matter what you say in secret. It doesn't matter what you try to do where I can't see you. I see everything. I hear everything. I know everything. And he sends Elijah the prophet and says, hey, you need to go to Ahaziah the king and ask him this. Why is it, are you, why are you going to this false god? I have proven over and over, and you are aware of it, that I am God, they're not, and yet you're going to send to him and asking him for help? And then the Lord pronounces judgment on Ahaziah. He says, because you have done this, you will not recover, but you will surely die. Now, I want you to notice, who initiates all of this? This interaction between the Lord and Ahaziah. It's not Ahaziah, is it? It's the Lord. It's the God of Israel. He initiates all of this. And you're going to see, and I'll show you here in a moment, it's a mercy, it's a grace that he does so. So his messengers try to go. Elijah comes and meets them and gives them the message. And basically they go back to the king. The king is like, whoa, why are you back so quickly? Ekron's a little ways away. Why, why did you, why, you shouldn't be back yet. In other words, did you disobey my order? Is basically what he gets at. And they say, no, this is what was told to us by a man. And look at how he responds. He says in verse 7, what kind of man was he who came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? And they answered, he was a hairy man with a leather girdle bound about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king said, sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him, and behold, he was sitting on the top of the hill. That's Elijah. And he said to him, that is the captain, O man of God, the king says, come down. Look at verse 10. And Elijah replied to the captain of the 50. He says, if I am the man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So he, the king, sent to him another captain of fifty with his fifty and said to him, O man of God, thus says the king, notice this time, come down quickly. Elijah responds, verse 12, replies to them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. Then fire, the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. 50. So rather than repent and address the sin that he is dealing with, what does Ahaziah do? He doubles down. He's like, I know this guy. Did you see how he, what did he look like? Literally, it's, he was a man of hair. Now we understand that to be is that he wore kind of like a tunic that was hairy. And the reason we think that, not just that he was a hairy man, but he wore a leather piece that had hair on it, it's because he is compared to John the Baptist. We'll talk about this in a moment. And John the Baptist did the same thing. But Ahaziah knows who he is. Ah, I know who that is. That's that prophet who spoke against my parents. That's that prophet who killed my mom's prophets. I don't like that man. He never speaks good of our family. But rather than repent, he doubles down and he tries to capture Elijah. Now, the Lord is the one who tells Elijah to say what he needed to say. So the Lord says, hey, go, go down. You will be protected. You're going you're gonna to bring my word to bear. And so Elijah goes and he pronounces the judgment. Notice, by the way, that Ahaziah is kind of, he just throws 102 lives away like it's nothing. Did you see that? He sends two companies of 50 with their leader. That's 51. He sends two of them. Doesn't care. 
Now, the Lord takes both of all of those people in judgment. That seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? You're like, whoa. I thought God was loving. I thought he was kind. What's going on here? Well, we need to understand what's at stake. Okay, the nation is living in ongoing unrepentant sin. They're following after the false gods of the Canaanites, and they were predominantly blind to it. You know why? They were blind to their sin because economically and politically, the nation was doing fine. They were prospering materially. So if the king can get away with challenging the prophet of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the people are doing okay, they're like, that ah, doesn't really matter. There's a lot at stake here. If Ahaziah is able to get away with it, the people will have no reason to repent. But God loves his people, and he's not allowed, about to let them get away with their own sin. And so in dramatic fashion, he reminds the people who's in control, who they answer to, who God really is. And he takes these men's lives in judgment. And he protects his prophet. And he demonstrates that he is the true God and that he is able to punish those who sin against him. That's why these men were put to death. In fact, you will see in the next group of 50, not all of them were stubborn and hard-hearted. Look at what it says. Look at verse 13. The third group gets the message. Look what it says. Verse 13. So he again, the king, still stubborn, not ready to repent, sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50. And when the third captain of the 50 went up, he came and bowed on his knees before Elijah and begged him and said, O oh, man of God, please let my life and the lives of these 50 servants be of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of fifty with their fifties, but now let my life be precious in your sight. Verse 15, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. And then he said to the king, that's Elijah, thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, it is because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word. Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. The third captain gets it. And that was the purpose. And that's the message that needed to be sent through the nation. What, what does God do? This man humbles himself to God's prophet. He, just, he comes humbly. He doesn't demand come down or even come down quickly. That's a strong message. But equally strong is what does God do with those who humble themselves? He's merciful. You see that? He, he, he gives mercy. He grants these men mercy. Why? Because they humbled themselves before the living God. That's a very strong message to the nation. You're living in sin. You're persisting in your sin. You're ignoring me. You're disobeying the covenant that I made with you. You're going to end up like these 102 men. But if you come like the, the third group of 50s and their captain, if you come and humble yourself and cry out for mercy, I will grant it. You see that? You see how that was the message that God intended for the people to hear and understand? So then what happens? Look at verse 17. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord which Elijah had spoken. And because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? It happened exactly like God said it would happen. And the proud king who would not bow, bow the knee the proud king who would not repent when he was confronted, who would not cry out for mercy, the proud king died. Just like God said he would. I would say in this passage we see chapter 1 is where we see the Lord graciously speaks to His people. There is nothing in His people that they deserve to be spoken to. 
We see God graciously appealing to and pursuing His people through His prophet, making clear and strong and powerful demonstrations that He is God and the false gods are not gods. And yet God still pursues them. He speaks. He's gracious. In the next chapter, we're going to see the Lord graciously provides for His people. Again, graciously because they don't deserve it. They didn't earn this. Where He graciously speaks to His people. Now, chapter 21, or excuse me, chapter 2, is an account of Elijah's, the end of his ministry and the beginning of his successor, Elisha. This pronouncement he made against Ahaziah that we just read, that's his last act as God's prophet. Now, Elijah has done a lot, right? We have read that last spring. But here is the transition from Elijah to Elisha. Now, I know those two names can kind of be confusing, right? Elijah means Yahweh is my God with the J. Elisha means my God is salvation with the S. Here's how you know who, the distinct, this is how I do it. Real simple. J becomes before S in the, in the alphabet. That means Elijah comes first, Elisha comes after. Okay, but this is a record of the transition. This is significant. Here's why it's significant. Because God has been already at this point abundantly gracious to His people. He has not completely obliterated them and judged them for their sin, which they earned, by the way. He sends the prophets to them. Come back, repent, address your sin. I will be merciful. Humble yourself. That's the whole pro- the, uh, ministry of Elijah. At this point, God is completely justified in saying, you know what? You had your chance. Elijah, come home. I'll deal with my people. But he doesn't do that. You will see, he will take Elijah, but he provides Elisha, meaning God will continue to provide what his people need, his word. He will continue to pursue his people, not because they deserve it, but because God is gracious. That makes sense? All right, so jump into chapter 2. It came about, verse 1, that when the Lord, that's Yahweh, was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Verse 3, then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Elisha says, yes, I know. Be still. Now, apparently, Elijah, the first prophet, Elisha, the next prophet, and the sons of the prophet, those were their kind of disciples, they all knew that this was Elijah's last day. Now, we don't have any details as to how they knew that. Perhaps the Lord told Elijah and he told the other men, or perhaps the Lord individually told all of them. We don't know. What we do know is that they all know that Elijah is about to be taken away. Everyone knows what's about to happen. Elijah goes to his successor, Elisha, and he says, hey, you know what? I got to go over here. Stay here. Elisha says, I will not, as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. This happens two more times where Elijah says, hey, stay here. I got to go over there. The Lord needs me to go over there. Elisha goes, I ain't going nowhere. I'm sticking by your side. Now, it appears as though Elijah's testing Elisha, like, are you really in this? What you're about to step into is a critical, important, difficult ministry. Are you committed? And I think that's what Elijah, he's testing him. Are you ready? Elisha passes the test and says, I'm not going from you. I ain't leaving your side. I'm going to be right with you. Elisha passes. He passes the test. Now look what happens. Look at verse 7. Now 50 of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. That's the river. Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters and they were divided. 
here and there, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more when he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He took also up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. They come to the river. They both cross the river. Right? It parts. And it's reminiscent of what happened, remember, with Joshua when he came and he led the children of Israel. The river divided. God divided the river. They walk over on dry land. The difference being is that Joshua and the children of Israel were coming into the land. Elijah and Elisha are crossing the other way, going towards Jericho. But it kind of, it's reminiscent of that. Elijah finally asks, what, is, what, what, what blessing do you want? Elisha says, in humility, I want a double portion of your spirit. Now that might seem a little arrogant, doesn't it? Like a little selfish. Like, man, is this guy just a showboat? And he wants, I mean, Elijah had done some great things. Is Elisha just trying to one-up him? No. In fact, I think he asks this in humility. What he is saying is, I understand what I'm about to do. I understand that I need to fill your shoes, and the ministry you have is now going to be mine. And the ministry you have is to stand against the whole nation and call them to repentance. That is a dangerous job, right? We saw that in the, in the life of Elijah. They tried to kill him several times. Elisha, when he asks for a double portion of his spirit, is basically saying this, Elijah, if I'm to do your job, I'm half the man that you are. I need a double portion of the Lord's spirit. You did it with your measure. I'm half the man you are. I need a double portion because I can't do what you did unless God is with me. It's actually a request of humility. Plus, we see the Lord grants him what he asked. Because he is, because what is the light? Well, if you see me get taken up, then you will know that you have got your request. And it happens. In other words, the Lord didn't think Elisha's request was arrogant or selfish. The Lord knew it was asked in humility. The Lord also demonstrates that he is, that Elisha is the true successor by what? He's able to. De- he says, where's the God of Elijah? The river parts. That's the Lord saying, yep, that's my man. That is my man. I approve and I declare with this miraculous sign that this is my new prophet. That's what the Lord is saying through that miracle. Now in the next few verses, the sons of the prophets, they come to Elisha and say, hey, let us look for Elijah. Maybe he's just like in another city. Elisha goes, look, he's gone. They go, let us go look anyway. They go look. They can't find him. Well, at this point, they're near the city of Jericho. And the men of the city come to Elisha. And they ask for a request. And this is what they ask. Look at verse 19, chapter 2. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold now, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. And so they brought it to him. And he went out to the spring of water and threw the salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day according to the word of Elisha which he spoke. 
Now, you guys remember Jericho, right? We know the, the old Sunday school song. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, right? That was Joshua. Remember what happened? And the walls came tumbling down. After that happened, Joshua cursed the city because they rebelled against Yahweh, the God of Israel. And that city had been cursed to this day. Evidence of that curse was that the water was bad. It didn't used to be. But because of Joshua's curse, it was bad. It was undrinkable. It caused death and disease. The men come of the city say, they know this is the prophet of Yahweh. They say, could you do something? We see God not only demonstrate that Elisha is his man, but we see God being merciful. What does he do? He purifies the water. He, and he does it with a jar of salt. Salt is, there was a lot to do with salt in the making of the covenant with the children of Israel. So it's just a reminder that this is the God of Israel. And he purifies the water. And he's gracious hundreds of years later and makes the water drinkable. Now, not everyone believed that Elisha was the new prophet and not everyone cared and not everyone was ready to submit to the Lord. In fact, we read about it in the last few verses of chapter 2. Look what it says. And then he went up from there to Bethel and he was going, as he was going up by the way, young lads came to him from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Verse 24, When he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. And he went on from there to Mount Carmel. And from there he returned to Samaria. Never curse a bald man. Amen. <laughs> right? So, I, you know, I guess I need to, like, minimize my ribbing of Chris and Todd and the rest of you who have uh, been blessed with such baldness. <laughs> Actually, it's a little deeper than that. It's a little deeper than that. You see, these young men are from Bethel. Bethel was a center of the, the, the cult that Jeroboam, a previous king, had set up, and he made idols uh, of calves, he made the, or these bulls, and he said, here is Yahweh, the God of Israel, and they worship in Bethel and Dan. So God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, was despised in Bethel. They didn't fear him, they did whatever they wanted. So these young men come from Bethel with that sentiment, and even the phrase where they say, go up, go up, is reminiscent of what just happened to Elijah. In other words, they're saying, get out of here. May you be taken away like Elijah was because we don't care what you have to say and we don't fear the God you serve. That's what's going on here. So then Elisha curses them and the Lord sends two bears and the 42 of them die in what is a just and righteous punishment. Now you might say, isn't that a little extreme? How can is that just? Look at this. Leviticus 26. This is in the part of Leviticus where God says, hey, if you obey me, you're going to be fine. But if you disobey me, all these curses are going to come. Listen to this one. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that, you, so that your roads lie deserted. You know what's going on here? God is doing exactly what he said he would do. Now, Elisha's the new man, the new prophet. If people are allowed to get away with mocking the representative of Yahweh, the God of Israel, then there's no reason to fear him. By the way, this mob of young men was larger than 42. It literally says 42 of their number. You know what happened? The rest of them who survived, guess what they did? They ran back into the city and said, this is what happened. We cursed the prophet of Yahweh and 42 of us died and that word would have spread throughout the land, which is what God intended. It was just. God wanted to teach His people that He must be obeyed and that He must be feared. And to disobey Him was not only bad for them, it was dangerous. Think of it this way. What if you were walking in a parking lot, right? And as you're walking through the parking lot, you're not paying attention, you're doing this. I know, totally hypothetical. That would never happen, right? And you're not paying attention as you're doing this, and a car is coming your way very fast because, get this, he's doing the same thing. 
I know, it would never happen, totally hypothetical. But you're walking with your friend, and at the last minute, your friend screams at you, get out of the way, and they push you onto the pavement as the car zooms by, and you skin your knees and your elbows, and worst of all, the screen on your phone cracks, right? And you get up, and your heart's pounding. You're probably afraid and scared, and, and then all of a sudden you're a bit resentful. Man, look what happened to me. Why did you do that? And then you look at your phone, and then you really get ticked off. But then at some point, you, even though you're jarred and frightened, at some point you look to your friend and you're grateful. Why? Because they just saved your life. That's what's going on with this judgment. That's the point. God, in a very jarring and frightening way, reminds His people, this is bad for you, and I'm, I need to remind you how dangerous this is. When you mock me and my word, you need to be reminded that I must be feared and that I must be obeyed. That's why we see the death of these 42 young men. Now, we can learn a lot from these couple of chapters, but I want to focus on three lessons that we learn from these, from these three chapters or two chapters. The first one is this. God will send trials in the midst of our ongoing sin in order to provide an opportunity to repent. Now, Ahaziah, the nation is like their king. Ahaziah was given three opportunities. He is facing political turmoil, right? Moab is rebelling. I don't have time to show you, but at the end of 1 Kings, he even faces economic trouble. He tries to go get more gold with the, the, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. But guess what happens? The ships are wrecked. And then he approaches, hey, let my men go with you so we will go get gold in Ophir, a different land. And Jehoshaphat says no. So he's thwarted financially. Financially, politically. And then there's the trial of his personal injury. It was a mercy for God to send these trials and afflictions. Why? Because he's pursuing Ahaziah. He's pursuing his people. Why? He's saying, look it. Come back. I care about you. I want you to come back. I'm making life difficult to you difficult for you so that you will come back. The only way to come back is to humble yourself and repent. God will do that. Now, that doesn't mean all trials are a result of our sin, right? We know that. We've studied that issue, right? Sometimes God sends trials our way in order to purify us, in order to test our faith, in order to mature us, but there are times when God will send difficulty in the midst of our sin, in order to bring us back to Himself. Look at what the psalmist says. This is 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your statutes. That I might learn your word. You used the affliction, the trial, to bring me back. God loves us. God loves His people. God will demonstrate His love for His people as He pursues His people, as He desires what's best for His people. And what's best for us is when we honor Him and follow Him. When God is honored, we are blessed. Everything He commands us is for His glory and for our good. Everything that is good for Him or good for us gives Him glory. God does it because He loves us. He pursues us. He will not let us get away with our sin. Now, God is patient. God is tremendously long-suffering. We see this in the life of His nation. We see that in our own lives. We see that in the lives of His people. The only reason you are not judged immediately for your own sin is because God is patient and long-suffering. Because God loves us. He's giving us time to repent. He's giving us the opportunity. Here's the thing. We never know how long that opportunity will last. 
God may say at any moment, come home. The question we need to ask ourselves, are we ready to meet Him? Now you might think, oh, what's with the scare tactic? That's not a scare tactic. That's the truth. That's a mercy. If you live in unrepentant sin and don't want to deal with it, my admonishment to you, my encouragement to you, my plea to you is repent and cast yourself upon the mercy of God. If you always seem to get caught in your own sins, if you seem to never be able to get away with what you do, if you're always found out what you're trying to do in secret, that is a mercy, brothers and sisters. That is a kindness where God has given you the opportunity. It means He's pursuing us. Now, if you can get away with what you do and no consequences ever come, that's not a good sign. Because that is a sign you're not His. You have time in this moment, today. Repent. Respond to the mercy and kindness of God. Second thing we learn is God can be trusted to do what He says He will do. God warned Ahaziah. He told him what was going to happen. Right? I believe that if Ahaziah would have cried out for mercy, I believe God would have gave it to him. You don't believe me? Write this down. We don't have time to read it. Write this down. 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 27 through 29. Ahab, the most wicked king of the northern kingdom, cries out for mercy. And guess what? God grants it. God says, you're done. He pronounces judgment. This is what's going to happen. And Ahab humbles himself of all people. And God shows mercy. I think Ahaziah, if you would have done the same thing, God would have done it as well. Not only that, we're going to see later on in the book of 2 Kings, he does that for Hezekiah when judgment is pronounced upon him. He shows mercy when Hezekiah cries out for mercy. But he didn't repent. And because he didn't repent, he died like the Lord said he would die. Listen to this. There is a limit to the Lord's mercy. There's a limit. Now, in and of itself, we would say that his mercy is unfathomable. It's infinite. It, it goes broad and wide. It goes deep and high. But the limit to his mercy, it's limited to those who will not humble themselves and repent. That's what that teaches us. If we don't, in humility, cry for the mercy of God, address our own sin, call it what it is, God will not grant mercy. And He has the power to do what He says He will do. However, there's another side to this truth that isn't so like, whoa, that's heavy, man. There's another side to this that's equally heavy, but it's good. It means that everything God has promised to provide, all the blessings He's promised to give and the protection it means He will do it. It means He's trustworthy. It means we can believe Him when He says He's going to do something. It means He doesn't lie. It means He is consistent if He says He will. Think of it. When He says, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, all these things that you need, God will provide. That's not a lie. That's not a, well, if I think about it, that is a promise. Because God can be trusted to do what He says He will do. Nothing, the book of Romans chapter 8, nothing under, under the heaven or on the earth or under the earth, no created thing, which is everything, can separate us from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can change that because God can be trusted to say or to do what He says He will do. When He says to us that the joy of the Lord is our strength to endure anything, He means it. We see evidence of it in the Scriptures where people are persecuted, they're tried, and they're afflicted, and they have joy, and they have the strength to endure whatever life brings them. The Bible says that He came. What is it? That we might have life, and that we might have it abundantly or to the fullest. You know what that, that, that verse means in John chapter 10, verse 10? You know what that means? Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is saying, as my sheep, I will give you life, and I will give you life to the fullest. In other words, it speaks of a sheep that is fattened, that is satisfied, that has more than they need, that is content. And what Jesus promises, that 
I give you satisfaction. Everything the world promises, all that it delivers, it is fleeting, it is temporary, it will fade away, it will not satisfy. But Jesus says, I satisfy. God can be trusted to satisfy you. He promised He's coming back. And He will make everything right. God is our hope. He will come back. He will make everything right. Our hope is in our bank account. It's not the government. It's not our possessions. It's in the living God. He tells us that and He can be trusted. Last thing. God always pursues His people in the midst of their sin. Always. Always pursues His people. There is no reason for the God of Israel to be pursuing Israel in these chapters. There's no reason. They don't deserve it. Right? If anything, they, they, deserve, his, they deserve His judgment. But He relentlessly pursues them like I said, he could have taken Elijah and said, you know what, you're done. But no, he sends Elijah. Why? Because he, he says, I love you. You're my people. I'm going to pursue you. He's going to provide them what they need. What do they need to hear? They need to hear from him. They need to hear his word. So he sends Elijah. I mean, we're told in the book of Deuteronomy, right? He says, man does not live by bread alone. Look at the end of that verse. But man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Jesus quoted that verse. Because he wrote that verse. God provides it. Why? Because he's pursuing his people. He's providing for his people. His people needed his word, and Jesus gives them his word. Listen to this. God does not wait for us to pursue him. If he did, he'd still be waiting. Think about that. God does not wait for us to pursue him. If he did, he would still be waiting. Why? Because no one would pursue him. God initiates everything. He pursues us. He seeks us. He pleads with us. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give your soul rest. I will give you satisfaction. He doesn't wait until we're holy. In fact, He does it when we're sinners. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Enemies, sinners. He didn't wait. Now you might say, well, ah, that's New Testament, man. You're pulling New Testament. This is Old Testament. You can't say that that's what happened here. Really? Really? Jump back a couple chapters. Chapter 3, verse 25. Speaking of Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, as acceptable sacrifice, in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. That's God's righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, that's His patience, His long-suffering, <clears throat> He passed over sins previously committed and put them on Christ. So that the next verse says, so that God would be the just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. You know what that means? These Old Testament saints who repented, probably that captain and others we read about in the Old Testament, what that verse means is that those sins that were committed against God, God passed over their sins and put them on Christ, would provide the sacrifice for their sins. God pursues His people. God doesn't wait for us to pursue Him because God loves His people. He had already predetermined to send the Lord Jesus. Even when His people were rebellious. Why? Why would anyone do this? Because God is love. Because God is kind. Because God is patient. Because God is merciful. God pursues His people. Don't ignore His pleas to repent. Don't forget how good and gracious and kind God is. Respond with humility and repentance. 
Maybe you need to do that for the first time. Maybe you need to do that for something that's ongoing. Or maybe you just need to be reminded of that. Here's what we learned in, in summary. Though the nation continued to spiral, and it was downward, God continued to speak. And he ultimately did this in his son, Jesus. That's what this is setting the stage for. That's why Jesus said, everything written before this was all about me. He's the embodiment of all of this. He is the pinnacle of God pursuing and speaking to and being patient and gracious to his people. It's his son, Jesus. So that's why we say, even though it's the time of the kings, it points to the real king. Amen? As the band comes forward, as we transition into a time of communion, of remembrance, this is one thought I have for you, and I've already said it many times. God didn't wait for you to pursue Him. He pursued you before you even existed. Jesus died almost 2,000 years ago. God took care of this before you ever even took a breath. As we come to the table this morning, let us be grateful and thankful that God didn't wait for us. Amen? Lord, what can we say other than thank you? You are so worthy of our adoration. You're so worthy of our worship. As we've been reminded about that this morning, I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters, may we not leave this place without marveling at your abundant, satisfying grace in the person of Jesus. Lord Jesus, be honored in our time together. Amen.